Um, we are going to move on to uh, Sean now um, and talking about disposition and funerals. Hello, everyone, and thank you again, Stephanie, for having me. Um, as she mentioned, I will be discussing final dispositions um, to help you understand your disposition options. Now, disposition refers to the manner in which human remains are finally hand handled or disposed of. Some of final dispositions in America today would be traditional or conventional burial, which is either in ground or above ground. Uh, then you have green burial. We also have full body burial at sea, fire cremation, pyre cremation, which is done outdoors, or aquamation, also known as alkaline hydrolysis or water cremation. Then you have body donation and a new disposition uh, just recently passed in Washington state would be recompose. So we would recompose your body. Um, some questions you might be asking as you go down the road of what to do with making funeral arrangements would be, do I need a funeral director? Now, in some states, it's legal to have your loved one's body at home after they die. I mean, not in some states, forgive me, in all states. Um, here in California, there's no law requiring a licensed funeral director be involved in making or carrying out your funeral arrangements. Um, who would have the right to make those final disposition arrangements? Well, in California, the right and responsibility goes to the following people in this order. And that would be first you, if you were to write down your instructions before you die, say in an advanced healthcare directive. Um, your healthcare agent, if you named one on your advanced care directive. Uh, your spouse or registered domestic partner. Uh, your adult child or the majority of your adult children, if you were to have more than one. Uh, your parents, your siblings or depending on who would be left that's surviving you, we'd go in the sequence of order and the majority of that would have to agree. Um, next question most people would ask would who be, who completes a death certificate? In California, the law requires that a funeral director get the medical and health information from the physician or surgeon who last attended the deceased person who is required to also complete these um, medical certifications and return it to that said funeral director within 15 hours of death. Um, they don't always get it to us that quickly, but we do try to make sure we get it as quickly as possible. You might also ask, must I, must I use a funeral home? In the majority of states, a family or community or religious group can arrange, uh, I'm sorry, can handle a death without hiring a funeral director. And you can do everything on your own, or you can hire a funeral consultant or a death doula like Jill or myself to assist. Um, you can prepare the body for burial. You can acquire the necessary paperwork, hold a vigil or a service, and transport the body to a burial site all yourself, given that you have the proper disposition permit. Uh, there are, however, 10 states that do legally require the use of a funeral director. And those states would be Alabama, Connecticut, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Louisiana, Michigan, Nebraska, New Jersey, and New York. Um, some may ask, must the body be embalmed? Embalming is almost never required and is an invasive procedure. You can get away with using dry ice or techni ice to re preserve the body for a short period of time. Uh, must one buy a casket is another thing to consider. Um, except for green burial sites, most cemeteries require the use of a casket or other container to enclose and transport the body. However, you can specify an alternative container, a simple wood, fiberboard, or cardboard box, which is much less met much less costly than a casket. Um, you can also build your own casket or buy one from a local retailer online at a fraction of the cost of some funeral homes. And funeral providers are required by law to accept said suitable homemade casket or one from an outside source, and they cannot charge you a fee for doing so 
or require that you be on site at time of delivery. How do I choose a cemetery? With all death related costs, you would wanna shop around ahead of time if possible. Consider the convenience and location where the cemetery meets your family or religious requires, requirements if there are any. Uh, visit several cemeteries, ask for a tour of various burial areas, and get a printed itemized price list of all services and merchandise needed. Um, be sure to check for restrictions, including type and size of monuments, whether a vault and markers can be purchased elsewhere, and if the type of grave decorations are allowed. Uh, what types of plots are available, you might ask? Well, most commonly is a single plot or one full-size casket. Um, some cemeteries allow cremation urns to be combined with a casket in one grave, and some smaller plots are sometimes available for child or infant-sized coffins. Um, there are double plots, usually sold to a couple, or two plots can be side-by-side side or one on top of the other, where they would be buried on top of each other. And many cemeteries do sell much larger family plots. So if you have a large family and you want to buy everyone together, you can inquire about that as well. You might also ask what other cemetery charges to expect. Um, there is perpetual or endowment care. Now, some cemeteries bill a family annually for the upkeep of the gravesite in cemetery grounds. But more typically, there is a one-time maintenance fee, usually five to 10 five to 10% of the plot price is added at time of purchase. Um, another cost would be opening closing fees. In addition to the cost of the grave, the cemetery will charge an opening and closing fee at time of burial. Uh, this covers the cost to dig the grave and to fill it once the casket has been placed. Uh, you would, if you're pre-purchasing a plot, you wanna see if you can prepay for that opening and closing fee at the time so there are no fees at, at time of disposition. Um, the other fee would be markers. Uh, the marker or headstone for a grave can be purchased from the cemetery, a monument company, or even online depending on the cemetery's restrictions. Some cemeteries make up their own rules. Are there less costly options out there other than traditional burial or, or green burial, or rather, burial. Um, and yes, cremation. Uh, more than half of the final arrangements in today involve cremation. The ashes may be scattered, buried, placed in a columbarium niche, or kept at home. Um, some cemeteries permit more than one container in a large, in a regular grave, or sell a small, less expensive pot for a special urn section. Another less costly option would be green burial. Um, this is a simple, often low-cost choice and is popular with most interested in preserving natural areas or conserving resources. Uh, the body would be buried in a biodegradable coffin or shroud without a vault in a green or natural cemetery. Or there also is the full body sea um, at sea where that's applicable. So if you live on the coast or near the coast, you can do a full body sea burial. A difference between interment and burial. Well, all burials are interments, but all interments are not burials. Interments involve placing a body in one of three places, a grave, an urn, or an above ground burial site. Remember, a burial is a type of interment. Uh, what is traditional burial? The concept of traditional burial has evolved over time. Early in America's history, the family cared for the body after death, wrapped it in a shroud or placed it in a simple wooden coffin and buried it at home or in a nearby cemetery. Today, for most Americans, it is considered traditional to use a funeral home, embalm the body and bury the casket in a vault in a public cemetery. Uh, but few of these traditional elements are required by law and families do have a wide range of choices. Um, In-ground burial refers to the ground placement of your loved one's body, generally in a casket. Uh, some cemeteries allow the bodies to be buried without caskets, often to meet requirements of specific religious or cultural groups. 
Uh, this form of internment may or may not involve embalming the body of the deceased. Uh, monuments or markers available in a variety of materials, styles, and prices typically are placed at the graveside as a memorial. Um, earth burial requires a cemetery plot and is usually includes additional fees for that opening and closing, as I mentioned previously. Um, there is also above ground, which is entombment. Entombment requires purchasing a crypt within a mausoleum specifically designed for that purpose. Uh, what is green burial, you might ask? Green burial is defined as a way of caring for the dead with minimal environmental impact that aids in the conservation of natural resources, the reduction of carbon emissions, and the protection of worker health and the restoration and preservation of habitats. Green burial also emph emphasizes simplicity and environmental sustainability. The body is neither cremated nor prepared with chemicals such as embalming fluids. It is simply placed in a biodegradable container, coffin or shroud, and interred without a concrete burial vault. The grave is allowed to return to nature. Um, my favorite is full body burial at sea. Um, if no casket is used, the EPA recommends wrapping a natural uh, shroud around or a sail cloth around the body and adding additional weight or a steel chain to aid in the rapid sinking. Um, burials at sea of non-cremated human remains must be at least three nautical miles from land in at least 600 depth of water. Uh, cremation is another form of disposition and cremation is the process of reducing the body to bone fragments through the application of intense heat. This procedure usually takes from one to three hours and occurs in a special type of furnace known as a cremation chamber or retort. The remains are then processed into a fine, finer substance and placed in a temporary urn or before the remains are returned to the family, they're usually transferred into an urn for permanent containment. We have in California, which becomes legal next month in July, alkaline hydrolysis, um, which this process involves using pressure, heat, lye to break down the body into a, its chemical components resulting in a liquid as well as in an ash that can be returned to loved ones. This process on average yields 20 to 30% more remains than a fire cremation. Proponents of this process say it's a more ecologically friendly option than cremation. And I'm one that says that. Then you have body donation. Now whole body donation or body bequest is the donation of a whole body after death for research and education. They're used for gross anatomy, surgical anatomy, and further medical education. Um, and that's basically all I have. So if you have any questions, then we'll get to those a little later. Thanks again, Stephanie, for bringing me aboard. Yeah. There is so much information when you start. It's not something that, it's not a dinner conversation we usually have, even though we are trying to start talking about our wishes and so on. But when it comes to funerals and disposition, it becomes endless of options that we just, there's so much to discuss. And one of the things that I love that Sean sent me was like, like we're having resources. Sean is like a resource person like I am. So she sends so much information and helpful tips. But one, one was like 82 helpful tips to get started on, you know, your own funeral arrangements. And I was like, what? <laughs> it was just a little too much for me. Um, and we have some that are definitely more uh, leaned in if you're asking the right questions. But this was a really great overview in a short period of time of like the onion layers of like kind of getting down what what different options are not just doing the traditional way but what else is out there and other people to talk to and communicate and we'll get over we'll talk a little bit later within that the range of values and costs and expectations can change so much so sean thank you so much <laughs> for for that uh we're gonna I turn it over. 
I just want to interject really fast. So I'm a life learner and I am so excited to hear from Jill and Sean because these are things that we need to update our advanced directives with. And so I can't wait to meet with you offline so that we can make our advanced directives even more robust. We have like the dementia provisions. Now we have COVID provisions. Now I'm going to have all of this other stuff. I'm so excited. I just couldn't stop. But yeah, it's thing. very helpful to know what options are out there. So when you're in that pre-planning stage, you have a visual of what could potentially happen. Yeah, and so, Sean actually great. has one that she shared out too that is kind of the larger, and that's kind of where I love the advanced healthcare, end-of-life planning. It's, it's all one. 